Welcome to Four Culture, exploring the richness of culture in our community through arts, heritage, preservation, and public art. My name is Vaughn Raymond, and I've been producing a series of documentary films for the centennial of the Ballard Locks and Lake Washington Ship Canal. One thing that's constantly impressed me during this project is how many amazing activities go on in the canal that we either take for granted or don't even see. One such activity is the huge migration of salmon through the locks and the canal that happens every year as they travel between their birthplace out to the ocean and then back again near the end of their lives to spawn near the very spot where they were born. You can't see that, but the ship canal is actually a kind of a super highway for salmon who are doing something that is really ancient and basic right in the middle of our bustling city. The following film lets you peer under the surface and realize what's going on. It's called Salmon in the City. If you've ever come to the Hiram M. Chittenden Locks in Ballard, you've probably visited our fish ladder, and you may have seen salmon in our viewing windows. Did you know that salmon have been coming through here for 100 years now? That's right, the Ballard Locks are 100 years old in 2017. I'm Katie McGilvery of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We built the locks in the ship canal, and we still maintain them today. For our centennial, we teamed up with local organizations to make a series of short films about the locks in the canal. As a natural resource specialist, I can tell you that fish that migrate through here are extremely important to the core, and I'm excited about the following episode called Salmon in the City. I hope you enjoy it. My favorite thing about the locks is the fish passage and getting to see the salmon as they migrate. I think it's really remarkable that you can come to a major metropolitan city and see a life cycle of a species that's been here for millennia. You know, it's one of the special species of the Pacific Northwest that we're really lucky to have. And the more people can see them and know about them, the more we can all be invested in their future. When people go to the Ballard Locks as tourists, they come here to see this engineering marvel of these locks that can move boats up and down and this amazing idea of a water elevator. What they don't realize is they're seeing a natural marvel that you can't see almost anywhere else these thousands and thousands of fish that are continuing to come back year after year through the ship canal and back into the Cedar River system where they have been returning to spawn for years and years and years and years. And to me it's just such an amazing part of the story to have all these salmon in the middle of a bustling city coming through here to go do their wild salmon thing. Well, salmon is the linchpin of the diet and the culture of the Puget Sound peoples. It's an important part of the people's connection to the landscape. Well, the salmon were the basis of our subsistence or our way of life, not only from a survival standpoint, but salmon were also important um, because of their spiritual connection to the tribe. Most of the tribes here believe that the salmon are people and that the salmon transform themselves every year um, into their salmon form to provide food for the people. So it's important that we take care of the habitat, that we use the fish in an honorable way and we share it and just take what we need and then save a lot to be uh, restored in the spawning beds so that they can go back to their winter houses and conduct their ceremonies and come back again and when they turn themselves back into the fish that we have always relied upon. Salmon are important to both tribal and non-tribal people that live in this area. Some people that don't even fish love the idea that salmon come into these watersheds and spawn on an annual basis. We have three species of salmon in the Lake Washington watershed. Coho salmon, sockeye salmon, and the Chinook salmon. 
There's many spawning tributaries, but one of the biggest ones is located in the Cedar River. Now salmon that spawn in the Cedar River will hatch out in late winter and uh, migrate down, immediately down to Lake Washington and then out through the Lake Washington Ship Canal into the ocean. Depending on the species of salmon, those uh, fish will spend two to four years in the ocean before returning as adults. Back up through the fish ladder here at the locks, migrate through the ship canal, and then back up through the Cedar River to their spawning ground. After they spawn, the adults will die and the eggs will incubate in the gravel for three to four months before hatching and starting the cycle over again. Once upon a time, Lake Washington emptied out into a river that no longer exists called the Black River. For thousands of years, when our native returning populations that were originally here came back in from the ocean, they were coming up the Duwamish and they'd follow their way around through the Black River and then come on up the Cedar and kind of do their thing. So here's what happened with when they built the Ballard Box. One of the things that they needed to do is they needed to lower the level of Lake Washington and diverted the cedar to feed into Lake Washington. And as part of that process, the Black River dried up. So it's 1917 and here I am and I'm a returning Chinook salmon and I'm so excited to get back to my native habitat and the Cedar River because I'm gonna fulfill my life's purpose, which is to spawn and then die because that's what salmon do. And then all of a sudden you gotta imagine the confusion one year when I go to where I turn left at the Black River and my river has disappeared. It is pretty well known that salmon have very well uh, developed smell. They can smell or use the olfactory organs to help them orient to the right river system and even to the right tributary within a river system and even to the exact general area where they were hatched. So those fish, even before they enter the Strait of Juan de Fuca, they can sense the water from the Cedar River and they follow that. And so what you started to see a few years later was the fish realized that they needed to find that thread, that scent of the river where they came from. And they were finding that as they came down through Elliott Bay, they were finding that that came through the ship canal. And what they realized is they needed to come through these newly built Ballard locks. When they first began to design the locks back in 1911, they knew they needed to include a fish ladder. These are the designs that they used in order to build the original fish ladder. A fish ladder is basically a series of steps where the fish can jump from weir to weir in order to get from a lower level to a higher level of water. We're one of the first fish ladders in the Army Corps of Engineers and in America, so it's amazing that they were thinking about creating a fish ladder back in 1911. The original fish ladder was built with good intentions, but it just didn't work as well as it could. So in the mid-1970s, we completely redesigned it and rebuilt it. So the original fish ladder had 10 steps, which allowed the fish to jump two feet from weir to weir. And now we have 21 steps that make it easier because it's just a one foot jump for each weir. From the months of May to October, you can come in this area and see all kinds of salmon, Chinook, sockeye, coho, and if you're really patient, you can look over the edge and sometimes they'll jump from weir to weir. Inevitably, I always blink when that happens, so you have to be very patient. But what's actually easier and more exciting is just down here in our viewing room. Not only is it amazing that the Army Corps of Engineers has a fish ladder here, but that we have interpretive displays in a viewing area that many can enjoy. Down on the lower level are five viewing windows with interpretive panels to show you the difference between each species of salmon that you may see in here. So the fish ladder is really for the adults that are returning to spawn and head into fresh water. But the smolt need an avenue as well to be able to make it out to Puget Sound and so what we've done is we install smolt slides or flumes right on our spillway dam that allow the smolt to shoot out to sea and live their lives for about three to five years out in salt water. Another thing that happens is when we 
walk through a boat, a lot of those smolt will be sucked into the tunnels that we use to water and dewater the chambers. And we realize that the tunnels have a lot of barnacles in them, and the smolt can be damaged with the force traveling through those tunnels. So each year, we dewater the entire large lock chamber, and a group of volunteers from the Army Corps of Engineers go down into the tunnels and scrape the walls of all the barnacles. It's backbreaking work. It hurts the next day especially, but there's a, a camaraderie when you, when you do the scraping and all different branches of the Corps of Engineers have shown up and, and helped out. In the summer months, you may see people fishing here. And not just anyone can fish here. What you're seeing are Native Americans from local tribes that have treaty rights to fish here. They used to fish here historically, and so the Suquamish will set up nets downstream, and the Muckleshoot will actually dip net out of our fish ladder. They'll also do some scientific research and count our salmon for us. We at the Department of Fish and Wildlife work closely with the Muckleshoot tribe and the Suquamish tribe to monitor fish populations as they pass through the locks area. Muckleshoot tribal fishermen will catch these fish out of the fish ladder and they're taken to a, another location where we measure them, determine what gender they are and how old they are and whether they came from a hatchery or not. So this right here is our Cedar River hatchery and um, this is where we um, hatch sockeye eggs. Um, we when they connected Lake Washington to the Puget Sound through the locks and Ballard, it changed everything up for the Pacific salmon. And while the replumbing was probably devastating to Chinook populations, having a lake between the salt water and the fresh water created the perfect habitat for sockeye. And so they were able to transplant sockeye into that system. And it's one of the most successful transplants of sockeye salmon in the entire world. Today, those natural runs are also enhanced with uh, hatchery stock. There's 147,000 eggs in this one katoy. The salmon that return, I count on them to give me hope that we as humans can play a part in keeping them coming back and even increasing their numbers because we have to hold on to this icon of the Pacific Northwest. Helping salmon pass through this area really is one of the most important parts of our mission here at the Locks. That's why we're always working on opportunities to improve the fish ladder and our other facilities for the salmon. For example, right now we're working on updating our fish flumes and we're working on replacing the stony gate valves within our large lock tunnels. These can help slow down the water and along with barnacle scraping, they help with the safety of our salmon. Our hope is that with improvements like these, we can minimize any negative impacts of the locks on salmon and make things easier for them in the future. Salmon in the Lake Washington watershed have a lot of challenges coexisting with the great number of people that uh, live here. And we as a society have an important job of trying to do our part to restore and protect the salmon populations that do inhabit the basin. When I come to the fish ladder and see fish in the window, I, I still, to this day, am excited. I think fish are one of the most beautiful creatures alive.